Good morning. Good morning. This is Dion Strohorn of the Chi-Town Multicultural Film Festival, and we're back for our eighth season. And today we're here with two of our filmmakers for Filmmakers Q&A. Now I'm going to have them introduce themselves and their films before we actually get started. Ladies first. <laughs> Hello, my name is Gloria J. Brown Marshall, and my film is Dreams of Emmett Till. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Hart, and our, our films are Windows and Healing. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, before I get into the questions, uh, I have to ask you guys, you know, we've just come through this pandemic. How are you guys doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I, I decided about six weeks ago, um, the truth be told, I'm doing well under the circumstances. I lost my mom March 13th to the second shot of Moderna. Mm. And that really messed me up. Um, I still don't know, and as most people don't know, the full effect of all the trauma we've been through. But having lost now both parents, I, am, I decided six weeks ago that people come to a crossroad and you can either go down or as some older um, um, female friends of mine said, or you can keep pushing forward. So I decided I'm gonna keep pushing forward and that I'm going to be intentionally happy. So every day I go out of my way to intentionally be happy, not wait until happy circumstances come and sweep me up and make me happy. I want to be intentionally happy. So when the birds sing, um, when I feel my legs out you know, under me walking, when I have like a, a, a nice meal to eat, yeah. when I think about a roof over my head, when the sun comes out, whatever it can, and even if none of those things happen, I'm still going to be intentionally happy. And like I said, at the end of the day, I don't know if we'll ever be able to assess the trauma, drama, pain and stress we've been through and the losses. But, you know, I just decided to choose that path and be intentionally happy. So how am I doing today? I'm intentionally happy. We're definitely I'm keep... glad to be here. And so yes. glad to be here. This is a blessing and an honor to be on your program and to have my film in this festival. Well, thank you so much. We definitely keep moving forward. <laughs> Hart? Yeah, first, um, yeah, sorry to hear that, uh, Mrs. Brown, about the, the losses of both of your parents. I, there's been just so many losses. I, I did lose a friend um, who I work with um, during these years. And yeah, she did just so much help for her kids and raising them here as an immigrant. So it's just so hard to see all these losses. But um, I think a festival like this is so important to bringing us back um, together to kind of heal together beyond any one culture. So it's just great to be back in this space. Thanks to Dion. <laughs> well, I thank you guys. Um, so um, Ms. Brown, Tell me about your film. I, I come to the film world as a playwright. Okay. And as someone who has written nonfiction books on um, racial justice and history. And so I knew the story of Emmett Till. I had taught about Emmett Till as an educator. And so it really was um, very important for me when Carolyn Bryant, now older, who was the woman who accused um, Emmett Till, who was 14 at the time, and she was 21 back in 1955 in Money, Mississippi, of accosting her in this little town, this dusty town store. And that, accost, that accusation of accosting her cost him his life in the most brutal manner. And then a few years ago, it was reported that she recanted. Right. And so I wanted to focus on a back um, story of the story of Emmett Till and the brutal lynching in the times of 1955 segregated Mississippi, but also the thought process of a person who knows that they're responsible for this murder and her son living with the, the um, burden of the murder. What would it be like today that she's an elder? How does she live with the guilt of it all? And so that's how Dreams of Emmett Till um, came to be when I read about her recanting. And then she recanted the recanting. So she said wow. later she never recanted. So that's just to me um, really played into the storyline. But what was such, you know, uh, I mean, God is so good. 
and creativity as well. I wrote this story without having all the back details. I, I shielded myself from all the back details because I didn't want that to be the story. I wanted my own imagination to be the story. And then I'm telling you, it gives me chills to this day, right this moment, when so many of the, 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 the facts, when I finally read up on it, aligned with my imagination. That just really was just so bizarre. People thought I knew all these facts and that's how I wrote the play. I intentionally refused to read any of that so that it wouldn't color what I was going to write. And it just lined up like amazing. So it, it was really very scary in the end, but it also gave power to the, the film itself. And because it was in the pandemic, we had to film on Zoom. So no one is in the room at the same time. This was in the heart of the pandemic. So that's the, the, so the platform we used was Zoom. And my directors from LA who had a film background, but not a Zoom film background. So everything was just, you know, experimental. Yeah, I, and I actually had the, um, the opportunity to um, view it. And uh, it's amazing how you all use technology. Not, um, this was just uh, not by chance. It just happened and you guys took advantage of the situation. And I thought it was uh, amazing how you put everything together. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Hart? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, what um, Mrs. Brown is saying, kind of, I feel connected to um, definitely these ideas of racial justice and all these, these tragedies that have been happening, um, of course, for so long, but then we're seeing them again more clearly now. They've always been there, but uh, so that kind of, I guess, inspired us to try to create um, short films about healing and just trying to get um, a certain calmness for our people because there's just so much internal struggle, I think, happening. So we also did experiment like you, uh, Ms. Brenda, with using Zoom. Um, so. <laughs> It was our first try and it was it was kind of fun and kind of crazy <laughs> but um so we just tried different things um but we definitely downscaled our, our production to smaller shorter films during these times so when yeah. when um when someone mentions experimental films they don't really have an understanding so Har, can you explain what an experimental film is <laughs> It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I, I've, I use the word like just offhandedly, I guess. Um, I feel like to me, experimental film is like, you're trying to be free from any particular category. Yes. You know, because it's like, I, I know there's a really good um, filmmaker named Trin Min Ha. She's a Vietnamese um, professor, um, kind of a social justice oriented thinker from Berkeley. And she makes, films that kind of don't fit into any one particular box. She calls them more like fluid films. And I, I had been kind of looking at her work and just feeling like that's something that interests me not to get like just pulled into one category. Um, but it still means that we follow the same kind of film kind of backgrounds with narrative and music, um, but just to try to give us a little more space to um, think about film processes. Yeah, I like that. So uh, if, when you get a chance, can you email me her name? Absolutely. And I can look yeah, into right that. Down. I actually like that, uh, Fluid Films. Yeah. I like that. I like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so so um, Ms. Brown, what was the, the, the goal in making your film? One of, one of the goals was to maintain the story of the brutality of Emmett Till, the 14 year old in segregated Mississippi who had come from Chicago to visit his relatives in Mississippi. And, and he was an only child and his mother told him that things are different in, you know, in the South and you have to mind your manners and everything. And if you think about this 14 year old went into the store, there was only him and um, Carolyn Bryant, who was 21, in the store at the time. And I, I was like looking at what could have transpired to, to cause this boy to be taken from 
his great uncle's home in the middle of the night and brutally murdered and his body thrown into the Tallahatchie River. And then you think, well, what caused, you know, Derek Chauvin to, in broad daylight, kill, um, you know, uh, George Floyd. Uh, George Floyd. And what caused, you know, George Zimmerman to kill Trayvon Martin? What, co- what is allowing people to take the lives of other people like this? And so that is something I wanted us to stay in our fresh memories, just to realize that we might have our nice clothes on and live in these places and think that you're in the United States of America. And the same things that were happening back in 1955 and 1915 and 1855 are still happening today. So I wanted to maintain that awareness with this film. I wanted us to know how easily lives are being taken with racial violence. And that, and I wanted people to come to, to realize that the Karens of the world, you know, these white women who are making these accusations that lead to the deaths of black men and boys and other um, um, people of color, other male color, that this has been going on for some time. This is not new. So that, so when I write, I like to write across generations. I like mm-hmm. people to look at history and realize that history is, can be a warning or history can be a lesson or both on how you act in the present and the future. So it's deep in the, in the embrace of the philosophy of Sankofa, that we have to know about our past to understand our present, to plan for a better future. And so all those things come into my film works, into my books, et cetera. But for this one in particular, I wanted people to remember this boy as a symbol of so much that had happened when his mother decided to have an open casket in Chicago that everybody saw what they had done to her son and to realize just as we saw George Floyd. And so in the film, there is a flash to George Floyd to let people see the connection I was trying to make that these things are continuing to happen. Yes. Uh, Hart, uh, I wanna kind of shift the gears for a second. Mm -hmm. Um, How did you come up with the funding for your project? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, you know, obviously we're not like Coca-Cola or Google or anything. So I actually, um, one thing is I try to keep our films we work on shorter and um, in a way simpler to try to keep funding under control. And I try as much as I can to do a front end work, like capture imagery, write the script and do um, just everything I can do with my time. Yes. Then I try to bring in the people who know more than me and more educated with the um, other aspects and a little bit later on. Um, So it's so I see it as a collaborative, but I try to really get it going first so it doesn't become um, too expensive Um, because I'm interested in more of creating short ones over a longer period of time. If if that allows for me. Okay. yeah, so, and fortunately, yeah, I work with people who are understanding too of my budget and are not like, <laughs> <laughs> they're not looking for like a Hollywood fee or something. Ms. <laughs> Brown, the same question. Well, I am so proud to say that the Law and Policy Group, which is a 501c3, is an, is an organization that, um, is the executive producer of it. So here's the, here's what's so interesting about our funding. Because I'm working with a director from LA. And so I asked him, what would this, what would this cost to make? He gave us a budget. And so I then set out to raise the money. And because I was working with a 501c3, people knew if they gave the money, it was tax deductible. Yes. So that worked out really well. Uh, Some of it, a lot of it came out of my pocket personally that couldn't be raised, but I kept the budget low. Also, I'm using LA actors. So these are real live LA actors who are in films in LA and other places, but because it was in the middle of the pandemic, they were all out of work for the most part, waiting for the studios to open again. So they were also, because of the death of George Floyd, they wanted to do something and they didn't know what exactly to do. So this was a project that they wanted to do. So they lowered their, their regular rates 
because they weren't working at that time anyway, and they wanted to contribute to the cause. So it, it was a confluence of great things happening at the same time. So I did pay them. Um, they, I did was able to negotiate um, a rate that they could live with. Um, yes. and, and even though they are very well-known actors, it, who brought their very best to the screen, they did so in a way with Zoom where they never actually saw one another. They were never in the same room because in the heart of Zoom, everybody was in isolation. So they had to be, you know, the only person who saw everyone was the director. And he and I have never seen face to face. We've never been physically in the same room. Wow. So, so it was, yeah, so there was a lot that went on that allowed us, that's why I said, it was just really a blessing, a confluence of things that allowed this film to take place. And because my, and I, as I said, I'm a playwright. So I wrote this as a play. I gave it to my director and he saw it as a film. So if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't have been a real film that I had in mind for it to be. He brought in the film techniques of LA. Yes. Because the East Coast where I am, New York, is about theater. Yes. The West Coast is about film. And so to bring those two things together on a Zoom platform resulted in Dreams of Emmett Till. So I give up all props, you know, to God first and to my director, <laughs> who really, he and I, like I said, we've never physically been in the same room together. And we've, this is our second project and we've never been in the same room together. Wow. So you, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the director, his name is, uh... Bobby Field. Bobby Field. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I, I thought that he would be part of uh, the Q&A, but maybe at some point uh, we'll cross paths. Yeah, at some point we'll cross paths. I mean, he's on set, but, um, you know, what I could really do is see if he can pop in, um, you know, before. How much more time do we have? Uh, we'll be we'll be wrapping up maybe in about uh, another 10 minutes. Okay, it might be too late now, but he's he really tries. This, as I said, this is our second film, but he's gotten very busy since um, you know we've come out of pandemic. Um, but he he was fantastic. I mean, just fantastic. The, it was his idea to use the archival footage. Wow. And I, yes, that was his. I that's why I said I give it to him. It was his idea to use our archival footage. And, 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 and he was so great to work with because a lot of film, the, the film directors don't like really working with the writer. You know, they're, they kind of like take the play. Yeah, hard to say, yeah. They kind of take the, the screenplay and, and then they go away and then you find, you, you sit in the audience with everybody else to see what your work looks like. But he actually worked very closely with me and he would say, well, you know, Gloria, you're really a director. Why don't you direct? And I'm like, you know what? I prefer writing better. So the ideas that I gave him, he found very useful. And so you see them in the film as well. So we worked really great with it collaboratively. We have another project that's coming up and we'll talk about that later. But I just I just think that he took my vision to a whole other level. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe the uh, next project you will uh, get behind the camera and direct. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, heart. So what what has been the biggest challenge in filmmaking that you've had to overcome? That's a good question. I, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of an internal battle. You know, I, I think there are self-doubts, like probably we all have, you know, and the world of film seems so powerful, like a filmmaker. And yeah. It's almost like an ego trip. <laughs> and I'm actually not interested in that whole world of bigness. Um, I'm interested in more of a minimalistic space um, or world. But um, I guess trying to accept, you know, you know, just have your own style. You know, try to accept you're going to bring something different. Not everybody's going to like it. And that's probably actually probably a good thing that not everybody likes. It. <laughs> uh, but I think our job is uh, people involved in film or art is to challenge the world in a, hopefully a good mm. way. Because like um, what you're talking about, Miss Brown, with all these tragedies, you know, the world is in such a place. And I think it's our job is to challenge it and say, hey, we could do better, guys. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, do, do you think that, um, do you think it's necessary 
or important to go to a, a film institution to be a successful filmmaker? Um, well, yeah, I'm someone who uh, went a very different path. You know, I, I studied um, psychology and counseling and did a lot of community mental health work. Um, and that's where a lot of my inspiration comes from. So I, I think to me that every day is filled with stories and narratives. And if you don't have the resources to go, there's other ways now, I think. At least for me, I try to go a different way um, and try to just learn some skills on your own. So I, I think the good part about now is there's more access to different technologies you can use. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I just use my phone and just, I'm, <laughs> I'm shooting out in the cold rain in the city of Chicago with my little iPhone. <laughs> you know, so, so I think that's kind of a fun part if it gets a little more fair that more people could participate. Um, so those are a couple of thoughts on it. Yeah. Okay. Well, Ms. Brown, how, how closely did you guys stick to the script? Being that everyone was working in different locations, how were you able to stay close to the script? Well, the good news is, since I was a producer and playwright, so during, and I would tell people in, in rehearsal, um, in rehearsal it would look like this, pretty, pretty much look like what we're doing with Zoom right now. And um, Bobby, the director, would have um, different um, actors come together to rehearse together. And one of the things I said to him was, I need to make sure that there is a vibe between the actors who are in certain pivotal scenes. And he listened to me and he really looked for actors who could vibe together. And so um, the script stayed the script because I wrote it and I was a producer. So I got to see, you know, make sure the script stayed the solid script I wanted. The vision for the script was what Bobby did to elevate it to film. Yes. Because what happens so many times when people film a play, it stays flat. But when you're in the theater, it's live. Yes. There's something that happens. And I know, yeah, you've seen that when people have filmed the play and it's like, for some reason, it's not the same feeling as when you're in the theater. And so what Bobby did with his filmmaking skill was to elevate the dialogue in the play. So the dialogue stayed the same, but when he intersected that archival footage and he did certain things to it, it livened it up to make yeah. it film. And so um, I want to touch on something that Hart said, and that is um, when I was, I, I did not get an MFA in film. My background is playwriting. So I went to Sarah Lawrence and I attended the MFA program in playwriting there. But I took a number of classes in different places and people should know there are all types of like one week, three day, four week screenwriting classes that you could take if you really want to learn how to structure things like that. You know, there are all kinds of like DC TV, for example, out of New York where you could take a one day class, a two hour class. So there, if you're something that you're interested in, there are a lot of separate places you can go without doing a whole MFA program at UCLA and coming out with $50,000 in debt. <laughs> you know, you could do other things where you're taking these kind of classes and learning um, different kind of filmmaking skills. Um, the other thing I would say is that, it's just like Hart said, you've got your phone, you've got Zoom, you know, all you need to do is take that and add your imagination. And you have friends you can who will say, you know, can you just act in this part? I mean, you don't always have to have like, you know, top Hollywood actors or something. You can, you know, there are people around and plus they're acting schools all yes. over. And so you can always get the actors from acting schools who just want to be in something to get their acting skills together and get credits for their, yeah. for their resumes. So there's so many ways to do this that you don't really have to invest like, you know, two, three years of your life to get an MFA and go in debt. All you have to do is search the, the and then Zoom has given us access to so much because yeah. I've taken classes in Denver and LA. I took a class in Ireland, all via Zoom. Via Zoom. So via Zoom, because Zoom, you know, gives you access to so much that it's really, 
taking advantage of it before it all starts shutting down again and people do everything in person. Right now is a great time to take care of that educational itch, you know, via Zoom. Yeah, I, I would have uh, loved to uh, made an investment in Zoom <laughs> uh, prior to, but it, it's, it's important that um, you guys touched on that because you never know who's going to hear this, this Q&A. And it, I'm sure it, it will inspire younger or emerging filmmakers. Now, here, here's a question that I know that the answers were differ for both of you all. So describe how you would ensure that production stayed on schedule for, for the mm -hmm. films that you submitted to this festival. Ms. Brown, first. Um, we planned out, you know, um, Bobby knew how much time he had. I knew how much time, because well, I've got a full-time job. And so I knew what days I would be available. And um, what was so interesting is, I don't know about heart, but when you're applying for festivals, when you're trying to even do all these things, I mean, I was just amazed that my Zoom um, film, um, I used to call, we call them Zoomies, because they're called Zoom movies. So we call them Zoomies, that my Zoomies actually got picked up by film festivals because they, they're, Dreaming and Matil is competing against traditional films. And so that was really big. So we tried to make the film quality. Yeah, we tried to make the film quality as high as possible. So we had our schedule set. We knew when we would be able to be able to rehearse and everybody agreed to the rehearsal schedule. So we really, as producer, I stayed on task with that. I also could pay people and pay them in increments so that nobody got paid all their money up front. Everyone was paid in increments. So I made sure I paid people because sometimes people feel like, you know, that they're trying to get ripped off, but yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. So I made sure that, that, that the payroll was met and I like being able to pay people. I like the fact that all the funds that we needed were upfront and accounted for, that the budget I created was a budget I could keep. Yes. And I think that's, don't overpromise people. Don't, don't say that you're gonna give them something that you cannot give them. And even the, the, you know, um, the, the, the music that we used, a lot of that music was open domain music. So that you can get music for free. Yes. in open domain, just go through and find it. So keeping on budget, keeping a rehearsal schedule and having a time period of what we call an, an, um, an opening night. So that if you plan, this is the date that you're going to have your opening night, then you work toward that date. You have a date certain. If you never have an opening night date, you'll work on that film forever. Forever, yeah. <laughs> There's going to be always something that you need to do. So, so if you already put out there, this is the date on the calendar that we're going to have opening night. We're going to tell our friends, this is the day. So then it really keeps that urgency going that you're going to get the film done by a certain time. Okay. All right. Yeah, you gave me a lot of great tips. Thank you. <laughs> I was writing that down. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say you're better at it than me. Um, but yeah, I I'm also feel sensitive to time because I don't want to like waste these opportunities we get while we're in this universe. Um, so I, I, I guess I kind of think of maybe a couple of pieces. One is um, just trying to be involved with people who have those same values of, of um, the values you're trying to show through your film and have that same level of um, kind of teamwork, not just kind of thinking about themselves, but thinking about the whole team. So I feel like if we work with the right team, it kind of naturally um, goes along much better. Okay. Um, but also one thing is I, I sometimes I, I think, okay, the time is up, the film is over and let's move on. But then I realize, oh, there's something missing, you know, there's, <laughs> or somebody will give me feedback. So I think we want our schedules to be met, but try to keep a little flexibility because somebody might say something or something could happen you don't expect in your film. Yeah. Uh, which could be important for your film. <laughs> so, um, those are a couple of things I think about, but uh, yeah. It, it, it's Our funny, and I'm sorry, I, I, I want to kind of bullet point, please finish. And I want to yeah. piggyback off what you just said. Yeah, that's all I got, yeah. 
Yeah. So so with that said, the next question, if you were to shoot your film again, mm. what would you do differently? <laughs> and actually, if we'll start with Hart because he was just mentioning if he saw something, someone mentioned something, it's like, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about healing, you know, that was the one um, that was like kind of during the pandemic. So it was, it was just me out there with the camera and the actor. Um, but it would be really nice to have um, another part of our team there um, to get another perspective, especially when we were doing the, the filming and cinematography. Yes. So that would have been great. But because of the vaccine time and everything going on, we just couldn't we couldn't do that. So. Um, but I guess that's what I would say. It's always great to have another. Uh-oh, you guys froze on me. Hello? Okay, uh, we seem to have a little technical difficulty. Um, please bear with us. Wow, oh, I'm jealous. That's <laughs> that is cool. How long it have is... you been there for? Yeah. I I you know it's so funny. I moved. Oh, he's back. Okay. Dion, <laughs> uh -huh. you're back. You're you're on mute. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Oh, and Dion and Dion is Gloria Brown Marshall. If you could add the Marshall. If I can add to Marshall. <laughs> yeah, Dion, uh, now I'm frozen. It looks like we were just saying, we, we were just praising Zoom until people freeze. And then <laughs> that's the bad part of Zoom. Getting <laughs> bounced out. Is freeze. that better? Yeah. Yes. Um, but now I look frozen to me. Do you see me? Am I, am you I moving? You're, you're moving, you're fluid. You're fluid. I'm fluid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let me just make sure I, we sh we should still be recording. Let me just make yeah. sure. You got yeah. it recording, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we were talking about oh, okay. shooting. <laughs> what would you do differently if you if you were able to shoot your film again? What would you do differently? And uh, and I thank you, Hart. If you can just kind of uh, wrap up what you were saying. I know you said uh, someone having a different perspective. Oh yeah, so that was kind of a solo shoot, but um, because of what was going on with the pandemic, so it was just me and the actor, but usually we have, um, there are at least like two of us out there. Yes. So um, my film partner, um, Yvonne or Albert, um, so they couldn't make it for that one. So it kind of also taught me how important it is and how lucky it is to have a team because it really affects your ability to capture perspective. Um, so if I were to do it again, it would be great to have um, them back out there or uh, okay. as a team, yeah. Okay, uh, Miss uh, Brown Marshall. Yes, I would probably look at the ending differently. And, and the reason why I say that is because I've had people say, I really didn't get the end. And I was like, okay, if I could go back, I would probably have Bobby reshoot the end to make sure it's clearer, you know, because something that I was working on for this piece and for my prior one, Shot Caught a Soul, is spiritual realism. And this, yeah. this, this philosophy of spiritual realism to me is that if we have access to the powers of God, through prayer. So we, we say, oh, God prayed and God healed me or God healed a friend or thank God for this, that. So then this haunting of people, you know, it's like, oh, I lost my relatives, but they're still with me. So if they're still with us, can we call on them? And if they're still with us, can people haunt other people? So in Dreams of Emmett Till, Emmett Till at the end, I would say is haunting um, Carol and Bryant. I just wanted to make sure it was clear. And maybe as a writer, I don't need to, you know, hit it over the head with a hammer to make sure people know it. But 
you know, I just had a few people go, I wasn't sure what happened at the end. I was like, oh, shoot, you know? <laughs> and I think one other thing is a technical thing is that there's a light, there's a light in the back that shows. And I was like, oh, if I could reshoot, have Bobby reshoot this, I would tell him, turn that light off in the back because <laughs> I can look at it and it distracts me. And it's like, oh, I wish that light would have been turned off in the back. So that, that was one of the two things that I would say that I would, but outside of that, Every time I see that film, I'm just like, wow, what Bobby did with my words are just, just a blessing. Yeah. I'm, and, I, and I'm just based off of uh, what we're talking about. Now I'm at a dilemma when to post this Q and A, because if I post it prior to your premiere. Oh no. Yeah. So <laughs> And then, oh. But I, again, it's, it's all about being organic. So I, I don't want to micromanage anyone's answer. Mm. So, uh, or I would probably, I could do the Q&A after. I can mm. post this after the festival. I'll talk to my team and, and, and you know, we'll decide what's best. Oh, no. But no, I'm no, sorry. no, no, you, you're fine. And I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to say anything. Um. But again, you know, it it is what it is. Hmm. So um, now I want a few more questions. This one question for both of you all. If you got an opportunity to remake a classic, hmm. which classic film would you go for? Hmm. Heart first. Wow. You have the most difficult questions I've ever mm -hmm. seen. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I would feel very intimidated, you know. I probably like, because um, there's just so many, you know. I'm trying to think of one. Um, actually, you know, I, I one of the films I really liked was To Serve With Love, you know. Um, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. One of my yeah, favorites. The, oh, is that right? Yeah. Sidney Portier, I think, you know, it's just, I don't know, his acting just like, um, just knocked me out. And like, it wasn't, it was more than just acting. <laughs> yeah. And like the way he used silence and different, I would probably not want to remake it, but just join, join it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Be a <Yeah>. part of it. <laughs> I hate that they, um, they didn't do a remake, but it was like a follow up. Yeah. I don't think you can go past Sidney Portier. I mean, yeah it's just it is what it, but I, I guess I would just want to be there and just be a part of it and I, and I wonder if you didn't remake it but if you did something like that now like just influenced by it like what that might look like mm. oh that, that would be amazing uh, just a thought yeah to I serve with love okay yeah. Miss uh, Brown Marshall I'm telling you that that is a difficult question yeah. I think about so many amazing films and um, and because, as I said, I began as a playwright and I've written nonfiction books and I think about, you know, racial history and there are certain like films that I would like to see a black version of. <laughs> so, like what? you know, and I, yeah, but. I, just, I don't know why, this is gonna sound so crazy. This popped in my head. I don't know, Dion, don't think, don't think I'm too strange when I give this answer. I was thinking about a black psycho. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so the, so Alfred Hitchcock psycho. Yeah, with uh, Anthony Perkins. Guy, yeah, with Anthony Perkins. <laughs> and, and I guess maybe from Get Out, I now started thinking about what would a black psycho look like, you know? So I don't know why that was the first thing that popped in my head. That is so, so very strange. <laughs> we, I mean, so, we're we're all filmmakers, so there's there's nothing strange. I mean, my my mind is always out there. Yeah, but Albert Hitchcock to me, I really I actually read his biography. I like reading biographies, yes. but I actually read his biography and and the fact that he was afraid of scary movies. Wow. And, but. Yes, he was afraid of scary movies and he would have anxiety. And his wife actually was a filmmaker as well. And so um, 
that the thing that really got me about his filmmaking was that he was meticulous with everything he set out to do. Yeah. So the birds, everything he would, he would every single thing that happened in that film had already been written out so that he knew exact. So the filming of it was the easiest part. And so I learned a lot about, you know, for as a playwright about building tension from that. And so, you know, I really appreciated him, I guess, more than I guess I could get into his headspace more than other filmmakers, um, because not only is he telling a story, but he wants to elicit an emotion. Yes. And so that's why, you know, um, Albert Hitchcock would be the director. I would, I, it just popped into my head, but Psycho would just be really a kind of like the socio a racial dynamic of Psycho if you had um, Anthony Perkins as, as, as a person of color. The, uh, yeah, so that's, is so important uh, for pre-production. So it, it makes production run so much more smoothly. The, yes, uh, and that's it. And that's basically what I was saying about how we did our rehearsals and everything that we like that, that Bobby Field and I really got our pre-production together. And because it was, you know, the pandemic, we didn't have a lot of other challenges like we knew, do right now in trying to put something together. And so pre-production was was pretty clear, you know, down to in, in the in the, the movie itself, in the in the you'll see that there are things that we did to create scenes within a scene. And to do that, we had to get all types of props yes. during a pandemic. And so that was really interesting too, to, you know, getting your props because, you know, people think that a film just happens and as Hart knows, everything they pick up, everything they do, you have to put there. <laughs> it's like, you have to find, you have to create. And so that's really interesting. Like you can get some things organically, but a lot of things that they're gonna be using, you've got to go out and find somewhere. And it was very difficult during a pandemic to find these items. So we ordered a lot on Amazon. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny you you would you would mention that uh we we talk about props and what happened with Alec Baldwin. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And and, yes. being, and and being given supposedly a, a cold weapon, but that weapon was very hot. Yeah. So it, it just lets yeah. you know how important it is uh, when it comes to to props. Uh, um, and I've had, I know a few prop masters who know every item that is on mm -hmm. that set. When it comes from a piece of furniture, a hat, down to an actual weapon itself. Wow! So it, it's so important. Uh, so so what? advice do you all have for new and emerging filmmakers? Ms. Brown, Marshall. I would go back to using your imagination and all the resources you have. If it's your cell phone, your friends as actors, um, writing that script ahead of time, um, having a schedule that works with your different work schedules, your times in advance, um, having the, the chutzpah to just say, um, I'm going to do this, you know, and not wait for somebody to knock on the door and say, you've got the talent to do it. A lot that I created, I had to create. I, I felt, you know, wow, somebody really should be giving me a break here and seeing that I've done things in the past, I'm worthy of investment. So self-investment. You're going to have to like, say, yeah, I'm worthy of outside investment, but for some reason, they're not choosing me. I'm choosing myself. So I see this story in my head. I, this story is staying with me. This story needs to be told. I'm going to tell it. And then as Hart said, finding that team, somebody else, and you don't have to have a whole, whole big team. Just have some people who have the time, money, and energy and the belief system that they want to see this project done as well. And, and also trust the the sense that when you put it out in the world, there could be other people who could take hold. And it may not be the people you think. It might be somebody else 
who doesn't look, act, or they're not even in the same vicinity where you are. And the last I would say, there are a lot of things to explore on Zoom that they don't have to be necessarily in your own community, but, it, but there are things in your community that you could find to be supportive, um, like the resources from these classes that are anywhere from an hour, three hours a day, three days, a week, whatever it is, but find those resources that you have and take advantage of those resources. And a lot of those places have scholarships. So even if you don't have the money to, to do it, you can actually ask for a scholarship or a reduction in the tuition. Okay. All right. Yeah, those are great points. Um, thank you. Yeah, kind of going with your name, Ms. Brown Marshall, um, you know the artist um, Carrie Marshall? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think he's Chicago-based. Um, he's done a lot of work internationally. He's a painter, an artist, and a thinker. But I was listening to an interview by Kerry Marshall, and he was saying, like, when you go to the museum and you look around, you should ask yourself, like, what's missing in this museum? Mm. And then you should have the courage at least to try to add something to that museum. And of course, we <laughs> I might not get into that space or what space, but the idea of adding on to this artistic dialogue over time um, and not feeling stuck with where it is right now. So maybe the museum is symbolic of taking a look at where film is in Hollywood is and say, hey, what's missing here from this conversation? And trying to have the courage to at least try to add something different or new. Um, I, I don't know, I was inspired by what he said a lot. Um, and he he did, I mean, he, he did what he said. Now he's in museums and he's changing our way of thinking in a good way. Um, also, the other thing, at least that helps me is, um, it's not directly about film, but getting out of your box, you know, get, like if you could be part of other communities that aren't your community and learn about other cultures or languages, because that kind of opens up your mind. So then when you come to the film, your mind is moving different ways that you might not know you could do that. <laughs> so. That's helped me, you know, I work as a therapist in the city, so I'm constantly being challenged in my thinking from cultures, backgrounds, countries, and that I think has helped me open up. Um, so those are those two, two things I might add on. Uh, and thanks again, Deanne, for bringing yeah. us together. Yeah, so um, Ms. Uh, Brown Marshall, what are you uh, working on now? I am, I am the author of a book, uh, She Took Justice, The Black Woman Law and Power. And so I wanna take that book and I wanna really highlight the true stories of black women from Queen and Zynga up through um, Shirley Chisholm and beyond. And the reason why I think it's just so important is because these are true stories. Queen and Zynga existed. And so my work, I want to empower, inspire, and inform. Those three things. And, and it took me a while to figure out what is the driving force in what I want to do. And it is to empower, inspire, and inform. And so I want my, my films to empower, inspire, and inform. And people might think, well, how does Dreams of Emmett Till with the murder of a 14-year-old and how does that empower? And you are empowered by history. So many people are confused by their own history. And so I want history to empower, inspire, and inform. And so um, she took justice, a Black woman law and power, um, my book, I want to turn into a series of vignettes on the women in the book, starting with um, Queen and Zynga and going forward. So that's a, that's a big part of what I'm working on now. Okay, how can we follow you? You can follow me on Twitter, and that is at G Brown, Brown with an E, uh, Marshall. G Brown Marshall, Brown with an E, Marshall with two L's. So you can follow me on Twitter, and I'm also on Instagram, at G Brown underscore Marshall. So G Brown with an E underscore Marshall. That's my Instagram. And so I just, if, if people want to author um, Gloria Brown Marshall, author A-O, A-O, A-U-T-H-O-R, author Gloria Brown Marshall is my Facebook page. Okay. Uh, Hart? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, you know, the team is is coming back together more now. It's a, hopefully a little bit safer conditions to film in. So we're we're trying to um, kind of go with this this flow. You know, we just finished up healing, and we're trying to make it into like a trilogy of of three shorts, we're kind of focusing on um, just topics that kind of came up during these these times in a kind of an abstract urban way. Um, so yeah, that's what we're kind of working on. And also we've been experimenting with um, doing some music stuff, music videos yes. and trying to use more urban imagery okay. in our work, yeah. So how can we follow you? Um, I don't think you want to follow me. <laughs> <laughs> you might you might get lost. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm going to have that's to hashtag that. Talking. You may see that on my Facebook hashtag. Don't follow me. You may get lost. No, no, no. I think when I was in college, I was dating my wife. I used to like to run when I was younger. And then yes. we were like running in the like way off campus somewhere. And I, and I said, just just follow me. And she got completely lost. And so, so don't do it. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you if you really want to follow me, um, you know, you can go to um, our website is digital-tapestries.com, digital-tapestries.com, or you could just search me out on Google Hart Ginsburg Digital Tapestries. Okay. Uh, that's probably the easiest. Well, I'd like to thank both of you all, Hart Ginsburg and Gloria Brown Marshall. Uh, if you want more information about our filmmakers, visit our website at www.cmfilmfestival.org. Don't forget to love yourself. While you're loving everyone else, don't forget to love yourself. And with that being said, I thank you guys. Have a great weekend. And I love you all. Thank you. All right. Have a thank great day. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.